Hello friends. I've ended up with a collection of Blu-ray players kind of accidentally. They're pretty easy to find in thrift stores and uh, for quite cheap. This one's $5. I realized that I accidentally ended up with sort of a collection of Blu-ray players that spans most of the technological history of Blu-ray players. I thought it'd be fun to look inside and compare and contrast. The evolution of Blu-ray players kind of gives a good example of uh, technology evolution in practice. Although this video focuses on these Blu-ray players, uh, I'd like you to think of it as more of a general illustration of what's known as the technology adoption life cycle. Look that up in Wikipedia. But basically, uh, as you kind of know from experience, things get smaller, cheaper, and uh, you know may have more functions or even less functions as technology changes and evolves. There's a kind of an adoption uh, that occurs of something like this for the very few video connoisseurs all the way to something like this, which is for the mainstream. And one of the themes along the way will be a phrase that I heard many years ago, which is, quote, get the nickels out. So when we go from this to this, not only does the cost come down due to increased manufacturing volumes, but it also uh, comes down due to technology and feature changes and that process uh, that's what we mean by getting the nickels out meaning that we have to find ways to make this cheaper so obviously the fact that it's smaller is going to be cheaper in itself generally speaking uses less power etc now another example even though a screw costs probably a fraction of a cent in production volume we even have less screws in this unit than in this unit. So that's kind of an example of getting the nickels out, even though it's only a fraction of a penny. These are from all different eras. Largest um, is the oldest up to the newest. And we also have a PlayStation 3 here, which is uh, not exactly a Blu-ray player, but it was critical in the adoption of Blu-rays because it included a Blu-ray player and basically you could buy this and get a gaming system or you could buy this and not but this does have a few extra features so we're going to look at all of these in various forms of detail open the lid on them and talk about what's inside and how it's evolved in a technology and kind of a commercial sense one of the things about blu-rays like with all new standards like this the standard is created and all of these will play this kind of example Blu-ray of Aladdin that I happen to have. So I hope all that interests you. If so, please remember to like and subscribe. Here's a PS3. This is kind of the second generation of PS3 which is called a Slim. Right, Scooter? Scooter is not at all slim. But uh, the original PS3 came out in November of 2006. The PS3, I believe, was critical in making the Blu-ray format dominant. It was up against something called HD DVD, which is largely forgotten. Only lasted for a couple years, and uh, but seemed to be competitive at that time. But basically the fact that Sony included this with the PS3, which was a big success in the video game world, meant that you would... Um, Excuse me, Scooter. So the fact that the PS3 was a big success in the video game world, I believe, kind of overpowered the HD DVD format. So this is this particular one is from 2009. Go backwards in time a little bit from this more recent PS3. This is a BDP S300 from 2007. It went for about $500, which I believe was more than the original PS3 cost and um, you know there isn't a whole lot of case to be made for this compared to uh, a gaming system that could do so much more but you know likewise uh, this does have a few features that you couldn't get on a PS3 and we'll look at those next. So this shows you the back of the two units here's the PS3 uh, you can see a much simpler connector array compared to the uh, true Blu-ray player. 
you can tell that these are kind of directed at different markets in a way. The PS3 came with this type of cord. This isn't the exact one, but kind of gives you the idea. You plugged in here and then you got more outputs. This was in the era when uh, HDMI was beginning to be widely adopted. People were beginning to get flat screen TVs, plasma or LCD. And uh, the old uh, composite video was dying out. You can see this is kind of a transitional unit on our Blu-ray player because we have composite video here, S-video, component video. We have digital audio output, analog, and multi-channel output. So there's a lot of options here on outputs. And you can imagine sort of a high-end video person of that era would be willing to pay maybe the same price or even more for this unit even though it can't do the video game function. Another factor to consider in this is that the video game machine were essentially sold at a break-even price where uh, they would try to make the money back on game licensing. So it makes sense that this would do something really significant internally and costly, which is a video game function. And here we've got some extra functions that really aren't honestly that expensive to implement but you can't sell this at a break-even price if you're Sony because you're not going to be making it up on the video game revenue. So this is more of a deluxe high-end unit for the video enthusiast of that era. So Here I've got the BDP S360 sitting on top of the BDP S300. So to compare those two in the timeline the lower one was about $500 in 2007. The upper one was about $300 in 2009. And you can see that the size has shrunk quite a bit. This one's thinner, same width, and uh, not nearly as deep. So for our next step, let's look at the back of these two to compare. Feature-wise, these are about the same, except that the newer one is missing some of the outputs. So this was in a transitional era when in 2007 you wanted, um, you know, all of these outputs if you were sort of a high-end video person. But by 2009, you maybe still had a TV that accepted composite video like one of the old CRT TVs. But you'd probably moved on and weren't interested in things like, uh, you know, component video and so on. Uh, you were probably using an AV receiver where you didn't need this dedicated output. If you wanted to use an AV receiver, you can always connect through the digital audio optical output. And or in, if you do it right, you can do that directly through HDMI, uh, maybe using your television's output. Another thing to notice here is these both have a small fan in them, so they produce a certain amount of heat. Now in our next segment, we're going to pop the lid on these and kind of look at the interior differences. Specifically, what made this one so much smaller than this one, even though the functionality is almost the same. So here we are inside the two units. We're going to kind of compare each major section. Power supply here is maybe 50% larger. These are both switching power supplies. Pretty standard for this type of unit. Got a main board over here that appears to be about the same size as the main board over here. The first one contains this uh, large heat sink. You can see there. Obviously, we've got a simpler back panel compared to this. In particular, this one has an extra board that's dedicated to the 5.1 channel audio outputs. And you can see that kind of results in a lot of blank space here. So there's an obvious opportunity to shrink things. Another noticeable difference in the Blu-ray drive itself. This is the standard format that would be used inside a computer. And this is more of a small size custom drive. So you can imagine that the idea was we're, we're going to make one drive at Sony that can be used in lots of different applications. And here we're going to shrink that down to kind of a special use drive that's just kind of the bare minimum. 
So mechanically, this is about the same as a DVD or CD drive. Um, these can be made very cheaply out of plastic and so on if they don't have the sort of the ruggedized approach that you need in a true computer drive. On one level, I kind of imagine that they want to give the buyer a big impressive unit to, uh, you know, justify in their minds the money that they're spending. But it's kind of a combination of if you want to have more output, you need more back panel space. And this kind of illustrates how, you know, we all kind of know intuitively that newer technology and electronics tends to be smaller and cheaper. Those two things typically go together. Um, so we can be smaller and cheaper, provide almost the same functions. We did lose this 5.1 channel audio function, but probably nobody's too worried about that a couple years later. So this is more for the sort of the mainstream consumer as opposed to the video enthusiast. Another area to look at uh, where we saved a little size and cost is in the front panel controls. This has a track skip feature probably to play CDs. You don't really need that for video purposes. Whereas here we're down to the bare minimum of play, stop, and uh, eject. And of course we have power on both units. This one also has a front panel display to help you look at CDs. So basically we lost a few features that you're probably not that worried about if you're the general home consumer. You can still play CDs and DVDs in this but you'll probably just use the remote control on the TV and you don't really need uh, so much of a front panel. So as technology evolves on these kind of things uh, there's a phrase I heard many years ago called get the nickels out. So, you know, how much did we really save with fewer buttons? Well, we saved a few nickels probably, but that's important when you're working with this kind of mass produced product. So getting the nickels out not only helps you in terms of nickels, but it also saves a little bit of uh, front panel space. So it has kind of a compounding effect. So our next Blu-ray player is this BDP-S6500 from 2015. Went for about $150 to $250 retail. And I ultimately ended up getting it for $5 uh, recently at a thrift store. This shows you the size difference between the two. There's uh, been a significant shrinkage here in size and also a change in features which we'll see on the back. On the back, as before, we had all of these outputs, but we trimmed that down to just HDMI, the LAN, and the uh, coaxial audio. Versus on here we had coaxial audio, uh, optical, and uh, also the LAN and HDMI, but a lot of extras here. This is where the USB port was that uh, was on the front of the newer unit, and notably the fan. Now looking at the power supplies of these things as a preview, this is just an ordinary power cord, nothing special there. But for the newer unit, we've got this wall wart, and that's important for a couple of reasons. One, these are going to be a lot cheaper to produce. This is kind of a commodity item that can be made in much larger quantities than a custom power supply inside a, even a mass-produced unit. Also, this reduces the heat inside the unit and uh, the volume required by the unit because we're shifting some of that outside of the unit. So next, let's compare these two with the lids off. Here's the uh, 2009 unit inside that we saw before. The thing to notice is this power supply board has been replaced in the newer unit with this wall pack. And there's a couple of things going on there. It implies that there's less uh, power required by the unit. The older unit is rated at 22 watts, and this power pack ends up providing about 10 watts. So we've cut the power use in half. You can see, just visually speaking, the drive itself appears to be about the same in both cases. So let's say that they'd already created a kind of a minimal cost drive at this point. 
we've got a main board that's shrunken maybe half the area of the previous main board the heat sink is simpler this is just spreads it out to the chassis using the chassis for passive cooling got some air vents on one side there's no fan this unit has become about as simple and cheap as a blu-ray player can become so I looked up the prices for this type of blu-ray player generally speaking this form factor on new currently they go for about eighty dollars so maybe half the price of this unit but ultimately aside from some ongoing price reductions due to improved technology you can imagine maybe a smaller main board in the newer unit something like that the feature set of this is pretty much at the end of the line this has the minimal features you would really want maybe we could get rid of the digital output separately that's kind of redundant because the digital data comes through HDMI but uh, we're basically at the end of the line here in 2015 in terms of size and feature reduction and uh, we've got a little ways to go compared to today of uh, cost reduction to complete the picture I've added the first oldest player back in with the other two now comparing the oldest one to the newest one there's as a guess about one-third the area for the new one maybe one quarter the volume this is a taller box um, here maybe about half the area and less than half the volume on cost we went from about five hundred dollars down to maybe 150 so maybe a factor of three on cost and we lost some features along the way one feature this newest one does have is the 4k upscaling so uh, we lost some basic features that in by 2015 were probably obsolete or not really needed particularly this is kind of in between 4k video was maybe in the early stages at this era of 2015 so uh, you know that feature made sense at this point you can imagine what's underneath here is a big IC that has a lot of integration in it um, so we probably were able to throw in the 4k upscaling without a lot of additional cost at this point in 2015 and as of today in 2025 blu-rays aren't exactly obsolete but um, they mostly been displaced by streaming services so blu-rays are still for sale uh, they're fairly common in thrift stores that i go in now they're not in great demand or terribly expensive overall it was a successful technology and still is to a very limited degree so from its early days in late 2006 to the present uh, blu-ray has kind of gone through its whole evolutionary lifespan uh, it'll still be around for a while i assume but i think we can see the end of blu-ray players in the next few years uh, they're not hard to get in thrift stores. They're not in high demand anymore. And basically, the manufacturers are going to figure out that they should fold up on selling those because uh, they don't have the volume to make them make sense anymore. So that concludes our video. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed. This is kind of a technological demonstration of getting the nickels out and how a new technology evolves from something expensive with transitional features into something more mainstream into something that's truly mainstream and basically as cheap as it can possibly be so there's technological evolution in a nutshell hope you enjoyed this video thanks for watching and bye bye